again. Welcome everybody to our first seminar of the year. Uh, we are delighted to have Nick Proudfoot here to tell us about equivariant log concavity and the cohomology of configuration spaces. Great, thank you so much for having me. So um, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and, and not exactly talk about progress in representation stability, but rather an application of representation stability, which I hope is also a good topic for the seminar. Um, and it's gonna be like the most naive imaginable kind of application, right? There'll be a, a sequence of representations of SN, I mean, there'll be a representation of SN for every N, and I'll wanna prove something about it, and I'll prove that it stabilizes, and I'll figure out exactly how far out you have to go to get to stabilization. And I'll prove that the thing, show that the thing I want to prove, you know, behaves well with respect to stability. So I only have to check the unstable range, and then everything's fine. And then I do computer checks in the unstable range, and then I've proved infinitely many statements by representation stability. So I hope this is, I mean, I think of this as sort of what representation theory was developed for. So, um, so it's a naive, but also to me, exciting application of representation stability. Everything here is gonna be joint with Jacob Mather and Dane Miata and Eric Ramos. Okay, so you know, most of the beginning is just gonna be setting up the problem. So the rep stability will come at the end. So let me first say what uh, log concavity means. So suppose I have a, a sequence of non-negative non real numbers. So it's called log concave if for every i, you have bi squared greater than or equal to bi minus one times bi plus one. If these things are non-zero, you can take logs of both sides and it just says that the log of bi is greater than or equal to the average of the logs of bi minus one and bi plus one. So it, it literally means that when you take logs, it, it becomes a concave sequence in the, in the standard sense. Um, and sometimes I want to talk about a sequence being log concave, sometimes a polynomial log concave, I'll go back and forth and the polynomial will just be the, or I mean, I could talk about a power series more generally, but usually I'll talk about polynomials. So it'll be the finite sequence of coefficients being log concave. Um, there's also another important notion. I want to say that a sequence or the polynomial has no internal zeros. If you can sort of guess what that means, there's no zero in the middle. But whenever I have three indices i, j, and k in that order, if the if b i and b k are both non-zero, then b j also has to be non-zero. No no zeros in the middle. I can't have the polynomial one plus t cubed because the coefficient of t to the zero and t cubed are non-zero. But then in between that we have some zeros. Um, the the notion of log concavity with no internal zeros is in a sense more natural than the notion of log concavity because of the following lemma. If I have two polynomials, or it works for power series two, that are log concave with no internal zeros, then it's true for their product. And this isn't true without the no internal zeros condition. I'll sort of give an example right here. If I take one plus t and one plus t cubed, these are both log concave, even though g of, g of t has internal zeros. In G of T, the sequence is one, zero, zero, one, and the, the two ones are far enough apart that the log concavity condition doesn't break. But then um, if I take their product, I get one plus T plus T cubed plus T to the fourth, that fails the log concavity condition for I equals two. The coefficient of T and the coefficient of T cubed are close enough together that it does break the log concavity condition. Um, so, so it, I, I guess I labeled this example, but it should really be a corollary of, uh, of the lemma that is actually usually attributed to Isaac Newton, that if you have a real rooted polynomial, then it's log concave with, with no internal zeros. Because that polynomial factors as a product of terms of the form T plus A, and that's log concave, and then product of log concave is log concave. Okay, th there's another formulation of the condition of log concavity with no internal zeros, which will be really crucial for the later part of my talk. So I wanna give that. So I'm gonna call it strong log concavity. I'm gonna talk about a sequence or a polynomial being strongly log concave. If it satisfies the following condition, whenever I have four indices, i, j, k, l in order, 
with I plus L equal J plus K. So the sum of the outer two equals the sum of the inner two. I want BJ times BK to be greater than or equal to BI times BL. So you see, if I take, um, if I take the sequence K minus one, K, K, K plus one, that's exactly log concavity, right? That says BK times BK should be greater than or equal to BK minus one times BK plus one. So strong log concavity really does imply ordinary log concavity. Right? It also implies no internal zeros because if I had a sequence with internal zeros, I could find i, j, k, and l such that b, i, and b, l are not zero, but either b, j, or b, k is zero. So then b, j times b, k would be zero, which is less than b, i times b, l. So this strong log concavity, it implies log concavity, and it also implies no internal zeros. And in fact, the implication goes both ways. That's not hard to prove. So in fact, a sequence or a polynomial is strongly log concave, if and only if it's log concave with no internal zeros. Okay, let me connect this with some topology now. Um, so suppose I have a finite dimensional complex vector space and I have a finite set of hyperplanes in the vector space. And then I look at the complement of the hyperplanes. So these are complex co-dimension ones, they're real co-dimension two. So I pull them out, they're still connected. You can walk around them, they have interesting topology. The main example that I wanna keep in mind is a configuration space. So let me take my vector space to be CN and my hyperplanes to be um, HIJ is the point, set of points where the ith and jth coordinates coincide. So then when I remove all those hyperplanes, I have the points Z1 through ZN and CN such that all of the coordinates are different. So this is the con configuration space of N label points in C. Like I, I, think, I can think of these as N distinct points in C. And I wanna define B, BI of the arrangement to be the ith Betty number, so the dimension of HI of this space. And I wanna also talk about the Poincaré polynomial, so pi sub A of T, where the Betty numbers are the coefficients of the polynomial. Uh, let me talk about what you get in this particular example that I just said. So there's a map from conf n of c to conf n minus one of c just given by forgetting the last point. So if I have a configuration of n minus one points in c, what can the nth point be? It can be anything other than the original n minus one. So the fiber of this, this map is a fiber bundle and the fiber is uh, uh, diffeomorphic to the complement of n minus one points in c. And you can show that the Lorray Hirsch theorem applies. So this, this fiber bundle, it isn't trivial, but on the level of cohomology, it, it behaves as if it were trivial. The Poincare polynomial of the total space is just the Poincare polynomial of the fiber times the Poincare polynomial of the base. This says that the Poincare polynomial of the total space is the Poincare polynomial of the base times the Poincare polynomial of the fiber. Remember the fiber is just the complement of n minus one points in C. And then you can iterate this, do it over and over and over. And, and eventually you see that the Poincaré polynomial is the product as k goes from one to n minus one of one plus kt. That polynomial, the coefficients are called unsigned Stirling numbers of the first kind. And of course, by this result of Newton, they form a, a, log, a strongly log concave sequence, right? Because that's a real rooted polynomial. It's a, poly, it's a product of linear forms. This is too much to ask for in general. Usually when you take a the complement of a hyperplane arrangement, the Poincaré polynomial does not factor like this. This is a very special case. So, so real rootedness, that doesn't happen in general, but strong log concavity always holds. So this is a theorem of Jun Ha from 2012. For any hyperplane arrangement, the Poincaré polynomial of the complement is strongly log concave. I won't really talk about the proof, but this was conjectured in 1976. And interestingly, the proof does not use the interpretation of the coefficients as Betty numbers. Um, you know, it, it uses a different topological interpretation of the coefficients. It defines some, uh, uses a certain compactification of this space called the wonderful model of De Concini and Percesi and interprets these numbers as intersection numbers on the compactification. It's totally orthogonal to the interpretation as uh, Betty numbers. 
that's that's all I'm going to say about that. And any questions before I move on? Okay, just as a little digression, this stuff works not just for hyperplane arrangements, but for matroids. I won't say what a matroid is, but it's some sort of combinatorial abstraction of a hyperplane arrangement. So any hyperplane arrangement determines a matroid, but not all matroids come from arrangements. When you have a matroid, you can write down a graded ring called the Orlick-Solomon algebra. And if it's the matroid associated with an arrangement, that Orlick-Solomon algebra is exactly the cohomology of the complement of the arrangement. Um, and you can define the, the Poincaré polynomial of the matroid in terms of the, you know, using the, the Orlick-Solomon algebra instead of the cohomology. And then a theorem of Adepresito, Ha, and Katz is that for any matroid, the Poincaré polynomial of the matroid is log concave, strongly log concave. That's a generalization of the theorem on the previous page. Okay, so now I wanna start doing the representation part. I wanna incorporate symmetries of the arrangement or the matroid into this, into this picture. So suppose I have some finite group gamma and I have a graded representation of gamma where the, the graded pieces are finite dimensional. Or if you like, if I have a sequence of representations of gamma, finite dimensional representations of gamma, B0, B1, B2, et cetera. So I wanna say that, that this thing is strongly equivariantly log concave if whenever I have IJKL with I plus L equals J plus K, uh, VJ tensor VK is bigger than VI tensor VL. And by bigger, I mean that, that it contains it as a sub-representation. So of course, if gamma is the trivial group, then these things are just vector spaces. And I'm saying that the dimension of this guy is bigger than the dimension of this guy, which is exactly the statement of equivariant log concavity for the, for the sequence of dimensions. Right? So this is a, a notion that generalizes strong equivariant log concavity for sequences of numbers to sequences of representations of a finite group. Uh, first, this is the analog of the statement that if F and G are strongly equivariantly log concave, then so is their product. Um, you know, the Poincaré polynomial of a tensor product is the tensor pro is the product of the Poincaré polynomial. So if B and W are strongly equivariantly log concave, so is their tensor product. And let me note, first of all, two statements. One is that, you know, when we were dealing with the trivial group in the non-equivariant version, strong equivariant log concavity was the same as equivariant concavity with no internal zeros. Here it's not true. So strong equivariant log concavity of, um, is, implies log con ordinary log equivariant log concavity with no internal zeros, but it's, it's not equivalent. It's actually a stronger notion. And if you take equivariant log concavity with no internal zeros, by which I mean, instead of IJKL, I could have said, you know, VI tensor VI contains a sub-representation isomorphic to VI minus one tensor VI plus one. That would be getting rid of the strong part. But if I do that, and I also assume no internal zeros, then this lemma fails. It's actually not preserved under tensor products. And so that means that strong equivariant log concavity is really the right notion. It's the robust thing that is preserved under tensor products, whereas any other notion of equivariant log concavity will not be preserved under tensor products. And both of these statements, I'm not going to show you with examples, but you can just write down explicit examples with S2 that you can do by hand. I mean, a representation of S2, it's just a certain number of copies of the trivial rep plus a certain number of copies of the sine rep. Very easy to tens tensor those together by hand, and you can just see these two statements. So it's really strong equivariant log concavity, it's, it's a stronger notion and it's, it's the right thing, it's the robust thing. Okay, so let's put it together and formulate the right equivariant conjecture. So suppose I have a vector space over C and a collection of hyperplanes and a group that acts linearly preserving the set of hyperplanes. So it doesn't have to fix the hyperplanes point-wise, maybe it takes one hyperplane to another. And that induces an action on the, the complement. So in my favorite example, so when you take the hyperplanes xi equals xj, zi equals zj in cn, the symmetric group acts. 
um, preserving that set of hyperplanes just by permuting the coordinates. And the induced action on the configuration space of endpoints in C is just permuting the endpoints. So, you know, the permutation switching one and two will swap the first point with the second point. So the conjecture now is that the cohomology should be a strongly equivariantly log concave graded representation of the group. Or more generally, if I have a matroid with an action of gamma, by which I just mean acting on the ground set of the matroid, preserving the notion of linear independence, then the Orlick-Solomon algebra should be a strong equivariantly log concave graded representation of gamma. And again, if gamma is the trivial group, this is exactly the theorem of Adepisito, Ha, and Katz, right? Because there, there's, there's nothing but dimension. You're just looking at the Poincaré polynomial. And this is the theorem that the Poincaré polynomial is strongly equivalently log concave. When gamma is non-trivial, almost nothing is known. So in, in particular, the case that I've been emphasizing where gamma is Sn and A is An, so this is, Sn acting on the cohomology of configuration space of endpoints in C, uh, that's, that's still open. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. Any questions before I move on? All right, let, let me talk about a, a variant of this conjecture. There are sort of a number of, of variations, but one of them I wanna talk about a little bit here. Suppose I have not a complex vector space, but a real vector space and a real hyperplane arrangement. And I do the following thing. So if I just remove these real hyperplanes, that would be really boring. It would disconnect my space. They're just divided up into a bunch of contractible pieces. I'd have no interesting topology. If I tensor with C, then I'd be in the case that I talked about. But let me do the next thing. Let me tensor with R3. If I take my real vector space, I tensor it with R3. Take all the hyperplanes, I tensor them with R3 and I remove them. So these are now real co-dimension three. So I have some interesting topology. If I did it with the braid arrangement, with this arrangement, you know, if I take the arrangement uh, consisting of the hyperplanes Xi equals Xj inside of Rn, and then I do this tensor with R3 thing, then the thing I'm going to get is the configuration space of endpoints not in C, but in R3. Okay. The odd cohomology is always going to vanish here. So let me talk about the cohomology ring, but let me sort of cut the gradings in half so that instead of having things in degrees 0, 2, 4, 6, et cetera, I have things in degrees 0, 1, 2, et cetera. So I, I consider this, this graded ring. So the degree i part is equal to h2i. Thing. Um, again, if I have a finite group acting linearly on V, preserving the hyperplanes, then it acts on the space and it acts on the cohomology ring. Um, and let me just note, you know, I have this real hyperplane arrangement. I can complexify it and then look at the cohomology ring of the complement of the complex arrangement, or I can tensor with R3 and look at the cohomology ring there. Those things are actually the same as graded vector spaces. The Betty numbers don't change but they're different as rings and, and they're different as representations of, of the group, right? So if I wanna look at the Betty numbers of the configuration space of endpoints in C or the Betty numbers of the configuration space of endpoints in R3, that's the same sequence of numbers. The ring structure changes. I'm not, I don't actually care about the ring structure here. What I do care about is the representations change, the action of SN changes. Um, if I want to understand that example with the Poincaré polynomial, I can use the exact same argument in terms of uh, you know, these fiber bundles by forgetting a point. So I'm going to get, as I said, the same Poincaré polynomial. But I'll show you that the representations are different. If you look at conf two of R3, you have two points in R3. Up to homotopy, the only thing that matters is the direction from the first point to the second point. So it's homotopic to S2. Um, by, I mean, S upper two, so the two sphere. And then you have a, an action of the group S lower two, which is acting antipodally on the two sphere. And in H2, that's the sign representation. If I do it in C instead of R3, again, I have two points and the only thing that matters up to homotopy is the direction. So my space is S1, the circle, and the group S2 acts antipodally. 
But now H1 of the circle is the trivial representation of S2, not the sign representation of S2. So you can see concretely that we're getting uh, different representations. You can ask why I stopped at three. It turns out there's nothing interesting after three. So given a real arrangement and an integer D greater than one, you could do this thing with RD instead of R3. Um, so in particular, you'd get the configuration space of endpoints in RD if you started with the grade arrangement. But it gives nothing new. So it turns out the cohomology vanishes in degrees that are not multiples of D minus one. And if you take sort of the cohomology ring you know, with the degrees scaled down so that uh, the D minus, degree D minus one part is, is in degree one, then if D is even, it's the same as if you complexified. And if D is odd, it's the same as if you tensored with R3. So two, four, six, eight, 10, et cetera, those all give you the same ring and the same representations. And uh, three, five, seven, nine, et cetera. So two and three are interesting and there's no need to go any higher. There's also a matroid version of this. So an oriented matroid is a combinatorial abstraction of a hyperplane arrangement over R. Um, so any such hyperplane arrangement determines an oriented matroid, but not all oriented matroids come from arrangements. Given an oriented matroid, there's a graded algebra called the Cordeville algebra. And if it comes from a hyperplane arrangement, then it's just the cohomology of this complement after tensoring with R3. So the conjecture now is that this thing is, a, this cohomology ring is a strongly equivariantly log concave representation of gamma, or more generally, the Cordeville algebra of an oriented matroid is a strongly equivariantly log concave representation of the symmetry group. So just to emphasize this, if gamma is trivial, then this is nothing new, right? I could have tensored with R3 or I could have complexified. I got the same Betty numbers. So the theorem that says when I complexify, I get a strongly equivariantly log concave, uh, strong, strongly log concave Poincare polynomial will also tell me that if I tensor with R3, I get a strongly log concave Poincare polynomial. Um, and similarly with matroids, the, uh, the Cordeville algebra of, of an oriented matroid as a graded vector space is the same as the Orlick-Solomon algebra of the underlying matroid. But when gamma is non-trivial, then, then it really is different looking at the tensor with R3 version rather than complexifying. So in particular, I've stated two conjectures about configuration spaces. One saying that the cohomology of the configuration space of endpoints in C is strongly equivariantly log concave. And one that the cohomology of the configuration space of endpoints in R3 is strongly like equivariantly log concave. And I don't know of any formal relationship between these conjectures. I don't know how to prove either one, but if I could prove one of them, I would not know how to use it to prove the other one. Neither one is known. Any questions before I start talking about rep stability? Okay, so, so the rest of the talk will be devoted to using representation stability to uh, obtain some partial results about these two conjectures. So, okay, I'm gonna take here, especially for this crowd, an extremely naive approach to representation stability. So, so bear with me here. So, okay, first of all, irreducible representations of SN are indexed by partitions. So I have an R tuple of natural numbers decreasing that add up to n. I'm going to write v lambda to denote the irreducible representation of Sn indexed by lambda. And given a lambda, which is a partition of n, I want to make a new partition of n minus one of n plus one by adding a box in the upper right, adding one to the first part and leaving the rest the same. So lambda hat one is lambda one plus one, and the rest are unchanged. And uh, I want to extend by linearity to an operation on isomorphism classes of representations. So if I have a representation of Sn, I want to write it as a sum of V lambdas, and then I want to sort of hat all the lambdas. So I want to, uh, uh, an operation that takes a representation of Sn and gives me a representation of Sn plus one. I'm going to write it V goes to V hat by saying V lambda hat is V lambda hat, and then I extend by linearity. 
Right? So this is, this is stabilization in the representation theory sense. Okay, and then if I have a sequence of represent uh, of sequence of vector spaces Vn, and each Vn is equipped with an action of Sn, I want to say for for a particular natural number p that it stabilizes at p if whenever I get past p, the n plus first guy is the hat of the is the stabilization of the nth guy. So this is what representation stability means to me. Of course, I'm aware that uh, a sequence stabilizes at some point, if and only if it exists, it admits the structure of a finitely generated FI module. That's sort of more the, the modern language of representation stability. But I want to think about this for the sake of this talk in a very naive sense. I just have a sequence of representations. And eventually, once I get to a high enough, far enough out in my sequence, I know how to read off the n plus first one from the nth one just by doing this stabilization operation. That's, that's all it's gonna mean. So, okay, I mean, maybe the basic example, if I take the permutation representation of Sn, uh, V0 is just zero, V1 is, is the trivial irreducible. And once I get past one, so Vn is this irreducible representation plus which of dimension n minus one, plus this irreducible representation of dimension n for all n greater than or equal to one. So this sequence stabilizes at two. A uh, slight warning here. When I say stabilizes at p, I'm using something a little different from what is called stability degree in the representation stability literature. So again, I'm using something much more naive. I'm saying, how far do you have to go until you can read off the next representation from the previous one in, in the most straightforward sense. Um, the key observation I wanna make is that this notion of stabilization is uh, compatible with, with containment. So if I have two sequences, Vn and Wn, they both stabilize at P, and if Vn is a sub-representation of Wn uh, up to and including P, then it, then it will always be a sub-representation of Vn. Because if I do this, this hat operation, then it, 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 respects <laughs> sub, uh, it respects containment. Okay, now let me state sort of the two non-trivial theorems that I want to apply. The first is, first is due to Trisha Hirsch and Vic Reiner from 2017. So if I fix an I, the sequence HI of conf N of C, regarded as a sequence of N in N stabilizes at three I plus one. And if I do the same with R3, it's even slightly better. It stabilizes at three I. So th the fact that, it, that they stabilize at all is, is due to Church in the very early days of representation stability. But uh, Church gets a slightly weaker result about where stability occurs. So if you, if you use the naive representation stability techniques, you say, okay, H1 is generated in degree two as an FI module. And that implies that HI is generated in degree two I. And that implies that stabilization kicks in at four I. So Hirsch and Reiner says, came and said, okay, yeah, it stabilizes by four I, but in fact, something even better happens. It stabilizes it in the sense that I'm saying at three I plus one or at three I if you do it with R3. Okay, so that's the first theorem I wanna use. And, and this is sharp. So this, that, that's really exactly where stabilization happens. The second theorem is maybe uh, less known in the representation stability community. In fact, this was proved in 2011, which was right right around when those first papers about representation stability was hap were happening. If, um, if Vn stabilizes at P in the naive sense that I describe and Wn stabilizes at Q, then their tensor product stabilizes at P plus Q. Again, this is not stability degree. This is the, the very specific naive notion of stability that I'm describing. Um, we actually looked for a while to find a result that applied this in the representation stability li literature and, and couldn't find it. But then Vic Reiner told us about, um, about this paper from 2011, which exactly proves that result. 
Okay. Um, let me refine a little bit this notion of equivariant log concavity. So suppose I fix a natural number m. I want to say that I'm strongly equivariantly log concave in degree m if whenever I have an i, j, k, and l with i plus l equals j plus k equals m, I have this property that vj tensor vk is isomorphic, uh, contains as a subrepresentation vi tensor vl. So strong equivariant log concavity is the statement that we have strong equivariant log concavity in degree m for every m. Another way to say this is that V0 tensor Vm should be contained in V1 tensor Vm minus one, which is contained in V2 tensor Vm minus two, all the way up to Vm over two tensor Vm over two if M is even, or Vm minus one over two tensor Vm plus one over two if M is odd, right? If M is nine, it's saying the smallest thing should be V0 tensor V9, and then the next smallest is V1 tensor V8, and V2 tensor V7, V3 tensor V6, and V4 tensor V5 in the middle. So, okay, strong equivariant log concavity is just strong equivariant log concavity in degree M for every. <coughs> right. So our theorem is that for both of these things where we conjectured strong equivariant log concavity, uh, we can prove that it holds in degree M for every M less than or equal to 14, right? So, you know, H, H0 tensor H14 is smaller than H1 tensor H13, et cetera, et cetera, up to H7 tensor H7. And similarly for, uh, for any M less than 14. And okay, I mean, now I've told you enough that I can outline the proof. So let's, let me ignore this one for a minute and just, just look at this one. That's configuration space of endpoints in C. So let me fix my M, which is less than or equal to 14. So I need to show that whenever I have I, J, K, and L, where I plus L equals J plus K equals M, uh, this thing here is a sub-representation of this thing here. Right. Um, both sequences are stable, right? So as n varies, this is stable, and this is also stable, and therefore the tensor product is stable. And stability works well with the notion of sub-representation, so I just need to check those n up to the point where stability happens. So where is that? By Hirsch Reiner and Brian Orlano Rosas, um, stability happens at, oh sorry, this shouldn't have been i and j, this should have been i and l, which is the same as j and k. So three i plus one plus three l plus one, which is three m plus two, or three i plus one plus, or three j plus one plus three k plus one, which is three m plus two. So when m is 14, I need to go up to three times 14 plus two, which is 44. And okay, so we did this on, you know, using a fast computer at Max Planck running 24 hours a day, that, that calculation took a few weeks to go up to n equals 44, but we did it. And, and, and that proves it by, by representation stability. And the statement for conf n of R3 is similar, but it's a little easier because stability happens a little sooner. Uh, it's at 3m rather than 3m plus two, then for that, we only had to go up to n equals 42. So again, the upshot here is using the theory of representation stability. I, I mean, this theorem is, I mean, of, of course, it's always nice to check things like this on a computer, but I wanna em emphasize that, that I'm making infinitely many statements here, right? I fix i, j, k, l, where i plus l equals m and j, i plus l equals 14 and j plus k equals 14, but I look at infinitely many n and I'm claiming that the, that the containment that you need for SI equivariant log concavity holds in those degrees for infinitely many n. And using representation stability, I can prove those infinitely many statements just by doing finitely many computer checks. And, and that's what we did. And great. So the, the full conjectures remain open. None of this tells you anything about how to actually prove, uh, prove that the conjectures hold for all n in every degree, but it gives us um, 
some pretty, pretty nice experimental evidence for the conjectures. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Let's all thank Nick. Do we have any questions for the speaker? Yes. Uh, so uh, this, this theorem gives us, uh, so if I'm at some value of uh, IJKL, mm -hmm. I get like some sort of a, like an SN equivariant map from VI tensor VL into uh, VI, VJ tensor VK. And that's like an injective map that's SN invariant. Um, and we have, so we have one of these maps for every N essentially. And so we can ask like, does that lift to a map of like FI modules or something like that? So we can ask for does equivariant log concavity hold in like, you know, some category of FI modules or, or some variant on it. Uh, do you expect that to be true? Yeah, that's a good question, and I have no idea. What, what I don't expect is for there to be a canonical map, right? You'd think that if you were proving log concavity, I mean, even not in the equivariant case, you know, if you're pr proving log concavity, you'd want to produce an injective map from HI minus one tensor HI plus one to HI tensor HI. And the point I tried to make earlier is that is absolutely not what Adepresito, Ha, and Katz do. Um, and there's no reason to believe that such a canonical map exists. And what they do is reinterpret these Betty numbers as intersection numbers, and then use the Hodge-Riemann bilinear relations in Hodge theory to prove uh, this inequality among intersection numbers. So, so there, there's absolutely no evidence anywhere to expect there to be a canonical map of vector spaces. And therefore, I mean, at, you know, it's not like here are the maps, are they compatible with the FI structure? So it would be pretty remarkable and fascinating if there were actually an inclusion of FI modules from HI tensor HL to HJ tensor HK. But I have absolutely no reason to believe that that should be true. I mean, could be true and it would be awesome, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't know. Is the computation uh, just like a brute force thing where you figure out the entire decompositions or was it uh, more subtle than that? No, I mean, yeah, it's brute force. I mean, there, I think there's no, I don't know of any subtle way to compute tensor products, right? So right. You, you can write down, you know, these, uh, these cohomology rings, you know, as symmetric functions and, uh, and then ask Sage to take the you know, Kronecker product of the two symmetric functions, which corresponds to tensor product of the two representations, and then take the difference and ask if it's sure positive. But that's it. So is there any way of thinking about these representations in terms of the geometry of the wonderful compactification? Yeah, so I've tried very hard. So I have a, a sort of conjecture or a form of a conjecture that seems to be false. And I would love a way to revive this conjecture. But yeah, so, right. So the, the idea is to take these uh, Betty numbers and in interpret them as intersection numbers in cohomology. And you do that, I mean, you have certain divisors and you take the ith power of this divisor times the i, you know, d minus ith power of this divisor and you push forward to a point. So the idea was essentially to work in K-theory. So you can, you know, instead of the cohomology class represented by a divisor, you can talk about the structure sheaf of the divisor and you can tensor them together, uh, take the derived tensor product and then push forward to a point. And if you work in equivariant K-theory, then at the end you're in the equivariant K-theory of a point, which is the virtual representation ring of your group gamma. You're gonna get a virtual representation and by general nonsense, the dimension of your virtual representation will be exactly the Betty number that you are trying to get. And the hope is, well, it's actually an honest representation and it is the ith 
piece of the Orlick Solomon algebra, and, and that's what you're getting. And then you'd want to try to prove an analog of the Hodge Riemann bilinear relations in equivariant K theory. That, that's always been my plan. It doesn't seem to work. I mean, you know, I've done some calculations where you write down the divisors and you do this derived tensor product and you push forward to a point and you want to get the ith graded piece of the Ehrlich Solomon algebra, but in fact, I'm not getting it. I'm not even getting, you know, a, an honest representation. Like I'm supposed to get the representation, the IREP corresponding to the partition 2, 1 of S3. And instead, I'm getting three times the trivial representation minus the sign representation or something like that. And then I've tried various other versions where, okay, instead of taking the, the structure sheep of the divisor, you twist it by a line bundle, maybe the line bundle associated with the divisor. I mean, there, there are a million variants you can do, and, and I just cannot find a plausible conjecture. I mean, I really want to want to come up with a K-theory version of this that at least plausibly gives me an, an interpretation of these uh, representations of my group. In, in terms of intersection theory, and I, I can't find one. So I, I think it's a good idea, and I hope that by finding the right variant, it will eventually work, but, um, but that idea has been a total failure so far. Do we have other questions for Nick? In that case, let's thank Nick again. Thanks again for having me.